Hello, one and all. Thank you uh, for having me. I'm Laure Turjanski. At present, I'm at the uh, uh, commissioner at the uh, Nuclear High Authority. I was working at the Ecological Transition Ministry in France, or the Ministry of Ecology. It has different names. And uh, that's the reason why I have this passion for these very interesting questions. First, I'd like to thank you uh, for our debates yesterday. Because you see, when you work for a ministry, what you do is that you roll out laws. The lawmakers uh, develop a framework that has to be implemented. And in daily life, you tend not to look at things with a distance. The vocabulary you use is a bit different. but um, And you don't even know that what you do is a bit of philosophy. So we have exchanges with uh, uh, architects, and uh, we need to speak to each other when we work for different ministries. On the basis of what was said yesterday, I thought um, I'm going to read again my presentation and the whole point is that during these 30 minutes I'll try and explain the role of the state to prevent natural disasters. I'll use a special lens, which was the lens I knew, which is that of major natural disasters. The word major is interesting. And what I did was not what the state usually does, because when we say major disasters, we say uh, that people, li people's lives are uh, at risk. And that's important. That is, we work on all types of risks. Usually we tend to think about uh, flooding, which is quite frequent because it might happen everywhere, but risk prevention is much more than this. We work about uh, on avalanches, on volcanoes, on hurricanes, on fires. So that's something to be remembered. And conversely, there are topical topics for which we don't use the same tools. It's a different ministry or department in charge. For instance, uh, the level of water in the rivers or uh, the swelling of clay. So major natural disasters, something that might kill people. I know it sounds very de technocratic, but I decided during my first part, since I'm a technocrat myself, to take this stance. At the risk of being a bit provocative, that means that as far as major natural risks are concerned, and as far as other risks are concerned, there's this partnership uh, at the ministry, and we don't do everything for the other ministries. We work with town planning and construction. Yesterday, one of the speakers who uh, delivered an excellent presentation on giants said that what kills people is not um, the uh, earthquakes themselves, but construction. And then there's also the water department and diversity department. And um, so we work with this department and services as well. They're very important. And we have a whole spate of other units and departments at the ministry. And there's a Canadian in the room who did the same in Canada, this tour. That is a civil security unit. If we protect human lives, we help the fire brigades and also the insurance unit at the Ministry of Finance and also uh, the overseas uh, services and departments and units. This is a map of France, but uh, natural disasters in France uh, have an impact on mainland France, but also overseas departments. And then there's agriculture, flooding in, uh, in farms, and um, also um, aquaculture. Natural disasters are like a trauma. When you lose buildings, you lose the archives as well. These are things that cannot be rebuilt. We've had friends in our departments who were really talking about the importance of prevention on heritage buildings and the other units in charge of local authorities because mayors have a role to play. I know it's a long list. It might be a bit frightening. I did it on purpose. And recently, a report was written up at the bequest of Fred Courant and the minister, 
and usually we say it's the Fred uh, who works with Jamy in uh, the TV program called uh, C'est pas sorcier on the culture of risks. And uh, the report uh, was uh, out in summer. And on such an important topic, we would need to have just one ministry that would uh, cover everything. I don't agree with that viewpoint. I don't agree with this recommendation. When we have something that's complex, what's very important is to ha take different stances. I don't think that one unit can cover everything. So we have to discuss with other departments. And that's why I liked hearing about you and your concepts and what you said yesterday, what you think is exactly what I think. But I think that what we need is to work with others that uh, think about time in a different way. Those who anticipate, those who are going to manage uh, emergencies, those who are going to work after the crisis has happened in different uh, territories uh, to continue this administrative list. Uh, those who are the very operatives, the architects and the town planners, uh, uh, and that is the Direction Départementale des Territoires. These are other departments and services that work with the prefect, and their role is to include all of these components, at least prevention and um, uh, town planning and uh, uh, landscape planning. So this is the, our map. It is complex, but at least you have to work with others. You have to find other tools. You have to work with different time uh, scales and space uh, scales. This being said, what do we do to document the collapses and to prepare the refoundations? Regulation or prudence? Well, it's always the same. What would the state say? We might think that what the state has to do is to regulate. Now, usually, when I deliver a speech, I say, OK, there are two questions. Where does the money go? And what does uh, what would the uh, law enforcement teams do? Well, regulation can be seen as something that's top down, that's imposed. That's something that's going to slow you down. The slow it will slow innovation down. Usually, when I discuss with architects, I say, what's very important is creativity and innovation. It's something that's ever changing, whereas a regulation is a law that's set in stone once and for all. So you have the right to invent as long as you stay in the framework. Is this something that slows down uh, territorial adaptations, or is a regulation something that is quite conservative, which is necessary, which would be the foundation of a careful framework used by other stakeholders? And. Uh, Again, with uh, my, my, my colleagues said, why are you doing this? Well, I started doing this when my colleagues had seen Cynthia, and they were traumatized for those who uh, experienced the Xynthia night. Is it the prefect who's going to help us? How can we evacuate people? What are we talking about? Well, we talk about all risks on all territories. And now back to my list again. There's Avalanche. There's uh, 1970 in Val d'Isère, 39 people dead. Grand Bormont. Uh, there's Landslip as as well, and the floodings in Nîmes, 11 dead, and Vaison la Romaine, 92 and uh, 56 people who died, and um, uh, the Aude uh, flooding, 15 people died, etc. So, this is the reason why I do this job, and um, we do this in a conservative way. I was there in 2018 and I heard the mayors of Trebes and Ville in the Aude when they were saying, Now, what's happening is awful. But we were better prepared than in 1999, because the floods are never the same. But the territory has improved between 1999 and 2018. And this is a very important source of motivation. I didn't mention the hurricanes and the Xintia uh, storm. I'd like to talk about the Xintia storm, because usually we think it's La Fosse sur Mer, that's what I said, 59 people who died. But the same year, there were floodings in the Var region, and as many people died as well. And this is when the risk prevention policy was relaunched again. Uh, it, there are stops and goes, and stops and goes. It's after a disaster that you're going to use other uh, state uh, levers or tools. So my first reason is to save lives. All the risks I mentioned will be impacted by global uh, warming and climate change. This is probably what would kill most people is uh, an earthquake, an earthquake in the West Indies. We're working on that. We're happy that it's not happened yet. And we're not really thinking about those in mainland France. But if it's in Nice, in the south of France, it wouldn't be simple if we had an earthquake. This is something we're working on as well. 
back to collapses, which is the main topic, and this turnaround point that we're experiencing, because all the tools I'm going to uh, show you have existed since 1995. That is when we realized that there was a climate change. And one of the questions we can think about when we think about prudence or being careful is, is this enough? I'll come back to this. We have the impression that we have precious foundations that we have to strengthen, but let's be careful not to challenge these foundations. The second lever that we can use if we talk about natural disasters is damage. I'm going to go through a long list again. Uh, we'll talk about the, all types of events uh, that we try and uh, have insurances for. If you've gone to La Roya and Vesubi, it's not all the total damages, but it's what's reimbursed by uh, the insurance companies, not the roads. That's very expensive. Irma, 2 billion euros of insured damages. The Rhone floodings, 1 billion in 2003. The Seine and the Loire floodings in 2016. In Romorantin, 1 billion euros, again, for insured goods. And uh, we assess that with the major flooding of the Seine River in Paris would cost 30 billion. Eric yesterday was saying a lot more than 30 billion. Those are the immediate uh, damages. If we have a capital city that's totally flooded with all the business losses that we would have, the total amount we'd be looking at would be a lot higher than that. And an earthquake quake in Nice, 15 billion. So that's for insured uh, property. So we have to work on that. In our department, we're saying, okay, we work for the insurance companies and for the firemen. That's what we say, uh, tongue in cheek. So this is what we do. That's important for architects and town planners. It's major disasters and risks that we work on to avoid uh, deaths and major damage. And finally, and that will be shorter, another reason uh, that motivates me, what I talked about was quantitative, but qualitative is something very important as well. I was lucky, I don't know if I should use the word, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Vesubi uh, after uh, the Alex storm, and that was incredible. Uh, the landscape has been changed forever. And um, uh, in the evening, you're really shaken. And uh, that's when you think it can happen everywhere. And um, it could happen in France. I don't know very much about what's happening abroad, but we've seen a number of events in France as well. So, okay, that's all very nice. That's the past. When I started working on these topics five years ago, people were saying, we can't appraise the impact of climate change. It's no longer true. Today, meteorologists can tell us that we can expect uh, more uh, large floods in the north of France. Uh, the weather uh, forecasts are a lot better, and we have uh, big data that help us compute all of that. We can expect, by the year 2050, an increase of 50% of the, the cost of total claims in France. So, is that sus uh, sustainable? for the next 30 years. This is a list I wanted to use with you because it really shows that the state services work on all of these uh, dimensions. And there's the time notion as well. We have to act quickly. There are more risks and higher levels of risks. But you know that changing regions and territories is not an easy thing, easier said than done. Well, when you're 50, well, look at the town I've, uh, I've always lived in, I've seen it change, but it's long. 50 years is long. It's a long spell. Things change, but it's slow. We have to act before there's a disaster, but also after disaster, many people are mobilized. So this is the type of cycle that we're looking at. We have to work on prevention as much as we can. We have to hurry up. Well, think beforehand, but hurry up once the disasters uh, t happened. And that's the timeline we're looking at. And this is what you can see in the political discourse as well. It's something that don't that not many people talk about. I'm very surprised because nowadays politicians have, have factored in the, the mitigation of climate change and adaptation as well. But prevention for natural risk is not something that politicians talk about except after a disaster when all the ministers come to talk about this. This is the only moment when you can change the cursor. What is the state doing? What about the money has it used? Well, the, uh, we, the, the state produces regulation. There are many tools. I'll be talking about one tool which is to me the most uh, stringent regulation. This is the Plan de Prévention des Risques Naturels. And it will be called in French PPR, that is, it's a, the Prevention Plan Against Natural Disasters, PPR. 
What's interesting about these natural disasters, and that's not the case in all public policies, for instance, industrial risks, you have a facility, you know that it's more or less exposed, you can work on that. Whereas a natural disaster is different. What's the starting point? What are we going to work on? It's what a geographer would do. We look at the map, we look at the different parts on the map, the different territories, and we'll say, what we focus on is major natural disasters, and therefore look at the level of risks and the challenges at stake. So we map all of these risks, and we look at the main towns. That's where we have uh, most of our population. And we, invent this, we invented this tool in 1995. It's the Barnier Law from 1995. That was the foundation of all that was done by the state since then. And what's very precious is that we have a tool that's been used for those many years. Usually the tools keep on changing, whereas here it's a tool that we still use. And many people are mobilized. If you look at the PPR map that have, has been approved, it's the one you can see on the slide. And uh, so we have 12,000 PPR plans that have been approved, which means that we have prefects and the departmental uh, divisions for the territories that uh, met the mayors and said, OK, your, your town is risky and therefore we're going to have constraints on your town planning uh, schemes. Usually the mayors don't like that. We start thinking about this. Uh, what do we have to change in the town planning for these given towns? And this is done this time in a bottom-up way, a bottom-up way. The prefects will look at the French département, will look at where the risks are, and that's when they come up with their PPR, Natural Disaster Plan. It's not fully scientific, nor is it technical. Some elected representatives like those, others don't really. So it might be easier with some uh, mayors. In the south of France, there's an interesting area that's all green. This is due to the swelling of clays. I know that this is not the most risky region, but we think perhaps it's the easiest thing to start with. So it starts from the highest levels of risks, but this uh, map is a bit of a political uh, map or approach. And then after Xintia storm, the government said, OK, we have no plan uh, against flooding on the coast, so please focus on the priority regions and our units uh, managed to detect 303 uh, places that had to have their own schemes. So it was not bottom-up this time, it was top-down, coming from the state. So what did we do? Is it the best thing? The Caisse Centrale de Réassurance uh, produced reports that show that showed these levels of uh, disasters. Where's the average level of claims or a disaster, top left, and on the right is what we've worked on. So top down or bottom up, they look more or less the same. So we've acted politically where the challenges are the highest. We have schemes that cover 89% of total possible claims and disasters. It might decrease in the future with the increase of risks. And the work we're doing with the Caisse Centrale de Réassurance, they provide us with all the claims data and disaster data and also so, well, available at the level of the ministry, the data for uh, these disasters and their future prospects and outlooks, this is helping us. We know where we'll need these prevention schemes in the future, these so-called PPRs. We can better document this on the basis of existing claims. Given the claims we have in the territory, we know where we need to have these prevention schemes. So what's the scope of these PPR schemes, uh, natural disaster uh, prevention? It's the major risks. Therefore, we document the benchmark risks, which is the most important known historically, or if we don't have a track record of these episodes, the flood the 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 the, uh, the century flood that's been modeled and then we produce a regulatory framework this is what the state does that is it is going to be impossible to build where there's a high level of uh, likelihood of a flood but also in the areas where there's nothing that's been built yet. So we want to protect people uh, from the natural uh, floods that might happen. And then there are other uh, measures for ri other risky areas. There's uh, a scale that's very important based on the level of risk, and there's part of that scheme that's a, a regulatory part. And uh, th also, this regulation uh, 
will aim at reducing the vulnerability of territories. The Loire Barney said we're going to ban things, but if it's, but we can also invest in prevention as well. This is something very important. The, the interpreters are very sorry. The uh, speaker is speaking at full speed. They will resume again translation. In addition, we invest to reduce vulnerability on buildings, and uh, the objective being to have more resilient territories, the most exposed territories. But there are other dimensions that are less visible. There's information for those who want to buy or rent a, a flat or a home. You've seen that. Usually you have to sign a document. People don't even read it. They say, OK, we have a disaster prevention scheme. OK, you sign this big thing. If the state does that, everything's under control. So we do this. We do this whether we buy or rent a place. And the mayors have to have their own local authority plan. We think that these territories are very much exposed and therefore the mayors have to be ready to manage the crisis. So the framework is not just for the town planners, it's broader than this. But there's something else not covered in this PPR scheme that people don't understand, that the journalists don't understand when they try and look at things and what's happened. They don't move the most exposed buildings. The PPR scheme is something that is looking forward into the future. But the fact that we remove buildings where there is a threat to human life and the worst peak of exposure to danger, we can do it everywhere in France, whether there's a prevention plan or not. Yesterday there were pictures from La Borelle. There were cases uh, on uh, the cliffs of the Pays de Caux. Those cliffs are made out of chalk and they are collapsing. It's not a prevention plan, it's a rural uh, landscape. But you cannot, um, uh, I mean, chalk, we never know when it will collapse and the state will buy back the houses without taking into account the risk for the inhabitants to save lives so they don't remain there. So we can relocate whatever the prevention plan. So after a flood, people say, well, there was a prevention plan. How come there are homes built here? In the Lode, La Treppe, the area flooded. It was an old village. There were houses that had been here since the 17th century. And the prevention plan does not get rid of those homes. It would be terrible. You couldn't live in that region anymore. But this is an updated regularly. It's updated when there is a knowledge of the hazard. So if there's a centennial flood and there's a worse one to come, we'll have to do it again. And it's complicated because when people want to rebuild, we'll constrain more because we'll take into account a greater hazard. And the question is, is can this prevention plan replace uh, prudence? Does it remove all our responsibility? So finally, there is an elected councillor that has to take into account all the components, including the risk. So why don't we let the mayor deal with this? And then the state pokes his nose into all this, and it removes all responsibility. So there's why do we have red lights when in a place when there's nobody at night? The other example are you know, when there is a dam, um, and when you go downstream, when you exploit a hydraulic dam, well, the person exploiting it, there is a certain um, lack in terms of uh, power. For, for this person, it's his dam. And in the summer, when this species can suffer, we can trust him. And you will have a reserved flow, which will vary according to the years, etc. So we fixed a given flow. Why? Because uh, there is a lack of trust because it's too complicated, because the electricity which is paid for, the protection of the environment is not protected, and we want to control things, we're going to have a reserved flow. And finally, the prevention plan, we have the same reasoning. Nobody wants a disaster. We can trust the elected councillors, we can trust architects, people are going to live there. Nobody wants to be exposed to a disaster. And finally, we don't do it. We say well, we're going to choose, since 95, we're going to go to the territories that are most exposed, that we have a framework. And so we put on attention private benefits. There's a degradation of the aquatic environment, and there are different temporalities. And the benefit is short term, and the cost is over the long term. And that is why the state, in its 
role as a sovereign decides to have a framework. Now, is the framework too constraining? Is it adapted? Is it efficient? When we work on all these topics, we don't you're not liked. The, the framework is too binding. When you do a PPR, it has to be done over three or four years. The one in Lourdes after the earthquakes has been going on for 17 years. Discussions, negotiations, etc. And then you have growing protests on the map of hazards. People would contest at the end, but now we have hazards, we have expertise, counter expertise, discussions. There are a lot of litigations which are on the procedures rather than the content, but that's probably because it's easier that way. And then we find something here which in the philosophical writing, something about Jean-Pierre uh, uh, Dupuis, the denial on risk. Well, we've never seen all this, nor my grandparents, and nothing will happen. And even if it happens, we'll all die, etc. So we don't want to deal with this. And when we do a PPR, we have the impression that we're bringing the risk. The people write to the ministry, no, no, my home, there's no risk. You bring the knowledge of the risk and not the risk. And so this position is quite funny. And some believe that it's a lack of trust, it's too constraining, and we don't need it. Others feel that it's not constraining enough. And here is the insurance companies. The insurance companies ask us to cover the entire territory of France with prevention plans. And it is probably not relevant and it is not graduated as it should be. They want a homogeneous framework over all the territories. They want us to review the prevention plans regularly to use the former prevention plans, which are more permissive. And there's a question of climate change in the prevention plans. And that's more complicated. The only PPRs where we integrate climate change is marine submersion because we have an idea which is scientifically documented about the increase of the level of the sea. When you ask the hydrologist studies on a water course to work on the flooding of the river, will there be impacts because of the climate change? They cannot tell us. So it's very difficult to constrain the urbanness on the possibility of a change in the water flow. So right now we're not doing that. Maybe it is insufficient. It's a foundation, but it's through successive reviewals of all this that we will be able to update all that. And then the other element, why our PPRs are not binding enough, the opinions of the environmental authorities. So well, they say, well, you've done a PPR. The environmental authority looks at everything, the impacts on biodiversity. They do not reduce the impacts on the territory that has happened. And to be totally transparent and honest, that's what I like to do, the fact that we prescribe reductions of vulnerabilities on habitat, we don't control that. We don't have the means to monitor all that, and we don't have the financial means. If we had prescribed works to reduce vulnerability, and if you don't do it, you will be penalized. Your insurance will cost more, etc. So it's a support approach, a kind of framework approach, but not a monitoring approach. So if some people feel it's not enough, others too much, well, it's good to be in the right middle. And then we can look at the efficacy of all this. And I try to look at the smartness of these prevention plans. And to pay a tribute to the former speakers, I'd like to flag something. Well, as I said, it is not a very binding approach. It is something that the elected members have to do this, and this is um, uh, outside of the source. This is done with the populations, with the local councillors, and the insurance companies would like to have a single map. But it's not the case when you have a territory where people are going to negotiate. Well, sooner or later, instead of having three zones, you're going to have five zones because you'll have to have intermediaries. So the legend of the PPRs are not the same all over France. All the maps, all the PPRs, that would be too many layers. And the PPR of Neuilly-sur-Marne and Neuilly-sur-Seine are not the same. They don't have the same captions and these documents are negotiated, technical but negotiated. And maybe that is a reason why uh, they are understood. And the maps, we have a national framework. There was a decree in 2019. So as to have strong principles, common principles over the entire territory, uh, there's one in France, the Netherlands no, don't do the same. In France, we don't have a dike to protect. The dike protects what exists. It is forbidden to build behind a dike. Why? Because we believe that a dike is not there forever. It can break. It might not retain the water anymore. And urbanization is there for 100, 200 years, and then the dike can disappear. So the reflection to, of protection to say, well, I have uh, water rising, I'm going to have a dike, and, and then I have a map. No, in France, it is forbidden. To 
give you examples of what is not allowed to do in France. But we wanted to avoid to fix certain things in territory. So this decree says in case of a urban renewal, if you propose an urban renewal to reduce the vulnerability, that is acceptable. And we even said that in certain territories where we have some major issues at stake, for economic development, uh, urban renewal, and that would be really constrained. We're thinking about Grenoble, where there are earthquakes, um, landslides, uh, floods, PACA, floods, etc., all the other hazards. Well, we can arrange by increasing vulnerability so long as there is um, work carried out with the civil society and so long as the local councillors work on this. The rest of the PPR is the state that takes his responsibility. When we densify a zone which is highly exposed, you ask for negotiations with the local councillors. So the framework is quite strict, but they do not want to set things in territories. Another question that could be criticized is is this rule on the highest um, floods in Nemours. Uh, it was quite uh, substantial in that city, and they said you'll have to have a new PPRs with uh, uh, higher risk, and the other areas were not affected in the same way. So two territories, well, one will have more constraints because that's where the flood took place. Now, if you apply to a whole cap, cap uh, capture area that, well, you have to try to find compromises. And the prevention plan, you have to take into account past memories, all people working on the natural disasters. They're all surprised by the fact that people forget very fast. Uh, in, for re relocation at Faute sur Mer, people had to go on their roofs and the firemen had to collect them from their roofs. But they don't want uh, uh, to do anything about it now. They feel that it won't come back again. And to measure efficiency, maybe I'm really running past my time. We can wonder whether we can measure efficiency. Well, is it on based on the value of the buildings? We do not see the value of the buildings. If you reveal that the house can be exposed, you fear that um, the value of the house may go down. And when I'm on by the sea or by the river, I have a nice view. I have a pleasant place to live. And for the moment, there is no play in the market. And when a building was exposed to such risk, it could be going through the information given to the people renting or buying. But when you have a, a house close to the station, close to the school, with a nice view, you can tell the person, well, careful, there could be risks. So we have to give that information. And the Caisse Centrale de Réassurance made the modeling showing that claims is much less in territories uh, covered by PPRs than the territories that were not covered by these PPRs. And that is reassuring. And the last point on which I wanted to stress to be proud of this PPR. It is coupled with a national solidarity system, which is purely French. The PPRs were set up in the same legislative corpus as the Barnier Fund for the prevention of uh, major natural risks, and everybody's not aware of this. But when you pay a um, house premium, there's a tax of 12% that will uh, finance this fund of national prevention risk. What does that mean? That means that the money coming from the insurance companies although the budgetary system has changed recently, will allow to prevent risk in these priority territories. The second element of solidarity, and this is Barnier Fund that allows you to buy back the houses without taking into account the risk. If you have a house, the houses we saw at La Roya, they're worthless. People can try to sell them. They went from 100 to zero overnight. And here, the state buys back so they can go and settle elsewhere. And it's very powerful. And the CAPNAT. Um, provision to reassure the insurance in case of a major natural disaster, there is a solidarity fund and half or part of what the insurance companies pays is taken by this uh, provision and the state pays at the very end. So the prevention plans are there to ensure the sustainability of this solidarity system, an alternative approach which would be maybe, if I could say so, more liberal. So each one has to be careful about himself. But once it is known by the state, you only have your eyes to cry if you have 
problems such as the fact that exposed areas can lead to great poverty. For the moment, natural risk is not there in the rates of insurance companies. You have to be careful because it's not easy. We see that there is a beginning of uh, tarification of insurances, and it will be modulated in the tariffs, in the franchises, according to risk exposure. And then there will be some social issues coming up because of these natural risks. So finally, the regulation might substitute individual prudence, but it is done in France in a corpus that has meaning, which is exhaustive in its interfaces with other policies, maybe insufficient considering the changes at stake, but there is a foundation and it is structured with other works, with the basins which are more, which are working more on all these issues of flooding. But as I told you, I'm not going to go into the details and there are different temporalities, and we can speak to all kinds of uh, people with the safeguard plan, which is related to all this. And then I felt, well, I thought with you, I thought we're doing a real advocacy here. And in the territories, it's difficult to do. There can be some hazard maps that are wrong. When I meet hydrologists with, with whom Eric works, well, the state arrives, and you have a flood map that is not uh, good enough. So it's not easy to do. It can be highly controversial. It's not easily understood. Uh, you know, party line, party language, what motivates me is that such approaches should not be perceived as something absurd, constrained, and imposed but as a sustainable development um, approach. And with climate change, we would go faster, we would do better if it was accepted in the territories. We have to teach people about this. We're talking about risk culture here, and it isn't perfect in its implementation. It isn't perfect in, in the teachings and the understanding of what this involves. We have levers like calls for projects. Some people know what we're doing on certain territories. We need to think about territories. We should not limit things to the prevention plan, but we need to think about uh, uh, land development. And there are two types of situation. Either the PPR is being reviewed and you can immediately have a constructive dialogue. Otherwise, it's a framework. And then it's the reading you have of it, the scale, and that's when you can exploit it. And the ministry receives letters, well, there's a risk of flooding, but I suggest floating homes. Well, that is not okay. If the response is floating homes, you need PPRs. You have to think about um, uh, the development beyond an object that can be resilient to an event, and not to mention infrastructure, which is a huge topic, which is not dealt with by the PPR. So a key moment to do this work is during reconstruction after the disaster, therefore. That is when we'll have to mobilize. I'm going faster because um, we're running late. Now, in the future, I see that we have a lot to do. Claims outside of PPR, the state works where, where there are a lot of people, but then you have all what's around. Then you have all the policies that do not embark vulnerabilities. You put a lot of money in energy renovation, and we're not asking if what we're renovating is re resilient or not. So we have to come out from our silos. And then you have all the natural risks, which are not major. Territorial transformation, well, that is even more your job. On all these territories, we need to work on floods that come back every two, three years, every 10 years. There aren't any deaths or major damage but there are people who cannot live in such areas. You have whole districts that have to be transformed, and the state will not do a PPR. So the way you develop the territory has to integrate the risk, and considering climate change, that is what's most important. And I'd like to end very quickly. I'd like to go back to terms that were used yesterday that I really liked for the Rhone. When you talked about geo-narrative, the state has a regulation, and we tell the story of the territory the PPR, we can put maps on the table. It's always good to have maps. Where does the water go through? People forget where the waters go through. I'm always um, startled when people do not know that they live close to a Civezo site, close to a plant or close to a river that's going to flood, that the, the waters are going to rise. And 
I would like to pay tribute to the work carried by Eric Daniel Lacombe and pay tribute for your work. Your Homo Hantam tells the story and makes it credible. It's the opportunity to say that we're going to put around the table the prefect, the mayor, and the people, the population, and we're going to tell them the territory. I'm going to rebuild it together. And we're going to understand that it's in our best interest to go back, to leave the space to nature, to have an adapted space for the people living in the territory. I've put Romorantin without the floods and the valley of the Vesubi. The valley of the Vesubi, that is not where we're going to rebuild. And this territory has to re think it's tourism, it's economy. And we really need you. There's a student yesterday at the end of the day. He said, and we, what are we going to do in all this? Well, what you have to do, well, Romorantin, the Vesubi Valley, uh, we'd like to really thank you, actually, because we need you. Et bonjour, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Thank you very much for giving me this occasion to present my uh, paper. And as you can hear, my French is not very good, so I will present my paper in English. So uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Yoon has asked what our, what our passions are uh, within the world of architecture and research. And I'm really interested in the way in which things work. I'm more interested in the process of architecture than the product itself. And I was uh, struck by uh, uh, Professor Dupuy's comments when he said, using the means to an end is more important than the means itself. And I, I agree very much with that. Specifically, my field of research is the interface between the disciplines of architecture and law, specifically how law affects architecture both good and both bad. Um, and there are many examples of how law affects the actual product of architecture. We can look at the layout of Paris, for example. We can look at the entire evolution of uh, Georgian architecture through the building acts. We can look at the evolution of the American skyscraper at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, again, it doesn't interest me as much because it's just how law affects the final product. I'm much more interested in the process uh, which is why this uh, conference, this uh, colloque, uh, interested me, um, because the process um, uh, of urbanization is, is a critical issue as it affects my major sense of, 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 uh, of passion, which is the health and the, the quality of life of the people of this planet. So um, the context of, of this particular paper, then, is the situation we find ourselves in. The current population of the world uh, is approximately 7.6 billion uh, people. That's going to rise to about 10 million by the year 2050. And it will go up. It will increase. 50% of the people currently on the planet live in cities. They are in urban environments. 32% of those people live below the poverty line. That's an enormous concept. What that means as we move forward into this century then is that we're going to see cities getting bigger and bigger. Cities of 14 million, 20 million. San Paolo, currently one of the largest cities on the planet, is going to look like a suburb within the next few years. And so this progress of just urban, relentless urbanization presents enormous challenges. A recent study by the Brookings Institute in America, for example, demonstrated that of the buildings necessary just in the United States, by the year 2050 for an, in order for us to live, to work, to play, to maintain a basic minimum level of life, quality of life. Only 50% has currently been built, only 50%. There is a lot more building, regardless of natural disasters, regardless of all of the other pressures on our planet. Just the relentless increase in urbanization and the physical consequences of that will continue. Given that the level of uh, attention and economy that will be applied to that construction will vary throughout the world. We are not just dealing with issues of quality of life. We're not talking about pretty architecture here. We're talking about maintaining absolutely minimum basic levels of health and safety for the population of the world. Absolute baseline. And the question is, if we're facing a risk for the next 50 years, how can we maintain levels of safety and of health that just in, ensure people basic minimums of life before we even think about the broader quality of life and the issues that we are going to face. 
Um, I think it was Professor Ugolini yesterday who said that the Italian constitution, health is a fundamental right, and I thought that was great. To actually see that established as a, as a, as a national principle and a law. But how do we go about that? Well, I, with my background, I'm an architect, not a lawyer, um, but I have watched how law has affected uh, the profession, and has affected the world. I would posit that law has a role in the improvement of the future. Uh, I, I'm a little concerned about the authoritarian ring of this particular uh, statement here by Lao Tzu. I, I think it's in the uh, it's in the sacred book of the East. It's allegedly uh, and ba basically the notion that one law properly enforced is worth all the words of all the sages. It kind of attacks us a little bit, but it's a good place to start if we're talking about um, the law as it applies to urbanization. In this case, it's got a built, we'll call the term building control, how, how building control uh, can, can be improved. There, is, um, uh, there are plenty of historical examples of this. They begin 2000 BC in Babylon, ha um, Hammurabi established a code of construction. Um, Nero, uh, Vespasian, emperors of Rome, uh, had specific regulations regarding the heights of buildings. Fitzalbin Assize in the 12th century in England uh, tried to control construction. Um, the, 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 it, it goes on. Uh, the London Building Acts, the, build, the Great Fire of London, whatever. Again, um, they don't provide us a great deal of, of, of context for the challenges that we're facing in the future. But what they do is it allowed me, as I studied the, uh, the, the building control systems that existed, the ability to construct a model a model that um, enabled me to research the issue of building optimum building control systems a little better. It's based initially on the uh, research of the general systems theory of uh, von, von Bertalanffy, um, but it evolved into a much more um, uh, complicated and, and, and I think sophisticated model developed by Professor Checkland at the University of Surrey called Real World Methodology. And it established um, essentially a model that comprised the following pieces. Uh, objectives, the societal objectives are stated, um, that what are we trying to do with this system? Um, what does it cover? Um, Decision-making subsystem, how do we take those objectives down to actually enforcing them? Uh, the, stand, the information involved, the standards. Uh, in, in France, that's the Association Française de Normalisation, AFNOC, I believe it's called. Uh, feedback. Does the system work? How do we complain about it? How do we fix it? And the implementation, the working interface, how do you actually get this stuff done? How do you actually get building to meet certain basic minima? It, it was quite a useful study, um, but it was two-dimensional. There was no climate of hierarchy between the various elements. So it wasn't particularly useful for, for, for my work. So uh, even though it produced a, an extremely complicated map, this is sort of like the French underground system on drugs. I mean, it's, it's very, very complicated. It's very two-dimensional. So what I tried to do was to um, look beyond to current building control systems around the world, uh, from big to small, Europe to Asia, capitalist, post-communist, high population, low population, yeah. just to basically look at what was going on around the world in building control. That helped a little bit in um, looking at those six areas and filling them out. So you see in objectives, um, some of these systems cover some really quite interesting areas. You know, convenience, the art of building, l'hygiene and um, energy consumption in France. Uh, we're only now just starting to see energy consumption becoming a factor in the United States. Um, and and uh, public decency in, in German. But health and safety were the kind of the baselines of all of these um, elements. Scope and coverage. Planning covers elements uh, within France, lot sizes in Denmark, mortgages in Canada, highways. Some of them are really quite broad in what building control may or may not cover. Again, this was just fleshing out and trying to get a sense of what a building control system could or could not do. Basic coverage, all of them did these. Sanitation, fire protection, structural strength, fire safety of appliances, stability, moisture protection, fire safety. It's kind of base, baseline material. Um, and also the definition of building was kind of, kind of varied. Uh, you have some of the Netherlands that, that basically identifies by type. In the, in the US, it could be location. Ownership in the United Kingdom, ownership. Boris Johnson, you don't have to worry about codes, apparently. Population, India, size in the tropics, size of buildings. So very different ways of defining what is a building. Um, 
decision-making substructure. And this is this kind of this, this, this element that takes the, 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 the kind of the, the whatever power is invested in the, in, the, in the kind of creation of health and safety and transforms it down to a level of actual implementation. This, this is something we'll, we'll come back to momentarily, but it's, it's probably the most important part of, of, the, um, uh, of, of, of the work that I'm doing here. Uh, and what I discover is some areas have very high control, high level of national control, uh, right the way down to the United States where it is, um, it is extremely um, localized, every municipality. There are, for example, 2,200 building con controls systems in the United States, 2,200 different building codes at different levels of um, outdatedness. Um, so it's a very, very different system uh, that, that we see here. Um, we see a lot of different variations here uh, from, from, uh, through, through, through the, uh, the uh, j'aime les boîtes. Information, again, these are the standards that are necessary, the development of new techniques, new methods of construction, new, new materials um, that will enable us to build better, build faster, and build cheaper, all key elements in ensuring that we can meet some of the massive urbanization challenges of the future. I go from extremely um, high level of, uh, of, of, uh, of development of standards and approval of standards down yet again to the United States, which tends to be a fairly more, a much more laissez-faire system of development of standards outside of the control, control structure itself. Feedback, what if something is going wrong? What if we have to appeal? What if there are complaints? What if we have questions about it? How do we fix those? Again, they're different frequencies. Some countries work at a very high level of frequency where those feedback loops are at a, at a national level, some at a very localized, almost kind of word of mouth level. Okay. And finally, implementation itself. Uh, language varies from the very legal. Building codes in the United Kingdom are written because they're parliamentary acts and therefore they're almost unintelligible to normal human beings. They're very legalistic. Whereas other codes are written in very, very simple, ordinary words. Build like this. There are some downsides to that, as we'll discover, but there are also some really in, in good sides in getting things built when you can understand the rules. Um, to cut a long short story short, as I, as I explored these variables, what became clear was that the decision-making substructure, the kind of the bit that controls it, the, the kind of the, within the middle from enabling to implementing, really affects all of the other elements of this building control system model. The, uh, the, the, the difference between higher level and, and lower level of control will affect um, the information, how quickly new information is filtered into the system that can actually improve or, uh, uh, or, or actually diminish. Uh, remember, putting information directly into the system is great if the information is really good. You take a look at the, uh, if you saw the tower block disaster in England of Grenfell, where a material was approved, a cladding material. It was approved, it was used a lot, and it was discovered that it had major fire uh, retardant uh, deficiencies and just basically blew a building, 85 people died. But there are still hundreds of buildings in England um, using that technology that was approved, which are now kind of have to, going to have to be changed. So very fast implementation of information is not always in the best possible advantage. Um, but that will affect information uh, dissemination the most. It will affect feedback, how quickly you can get bad information, good information. Yeah, this really works. Let's do more of this throughout the entire system. Remember, we're talking building on a mega scale here. Uh, and also the actual implementation itself, uh, how you actually get things done. Consistency has a great deal of advantage in uh, making sure that... Um, uh, things get done, things actually get done. Um, again, the words don't necessarily mean anything if they can't be carried through into, into action. So essentially the study basically came down to the notion of given that the local central axis is really the key determinant to how you get things done, given the challenges facing the world in terms of massive urbanization and the need for building, maintaining minimum standards, stretching towards a higher quality of life, how do we create a system that actually enables that within that local central spectrum? I, I, and I, I agree with your point that just massive centralization is a terrifying concept and not the answer, but because there, there are actually local advantages. Um, local advantages can take 
it can take into shape local um, uh, conditions, local customs, local habits. Um, you want a system that is, evolves and can actually work with various groups of people, that is not kind of a monoculture. Uh, you can write them in languages that people can understand. Simple, technical, basic language. Um, expertise is less necessary. That's not a bad idea. The future of the world will not be determined by architects, trust me. Um, it will be determined by everybody working towards similar goals. You don't want everything to be worked at a level of expertise that only the experts can take care of it. It won't get done. Timing, cost. You want this to be done as fast as possible. You want it to be done as cheaply as possible. Uh, and so you're looking for ways in which local uh, conditions can help to attract that. Frankly, that can actually take place. Like if you've got an appeal and it's to a person standing over there and they say yes or no, that appeal's done. If it's like in the United Kingdom where an appeal has to go through the system of the courts, it's gonna take you the rest of your life, well, two years. Um, it's gonna take a long time. It's not a way to get things done fast. And then the infiltration of error, as, as, as I mentioned. Um, in the, in the situation of Grenfell or in the United States with Champlain Tower, when something collapses, uh, the mistake that allowed for that could well be in many, many other buildings, many other parts of, the, of, of a city that could result in wide-scale collapse. If you're just doing something locally, the collapse will be limited, the damage will be limited. There are some advantages to that. As, of course, there are advantages to the centralized system uh, as, as well. Um, and again, we're not talking about individual buildings here. We're talking about mass construction, huge amounts of construction necessary. <sighs> Codes themselves, a single code um, enables the ability to have, a, to have a universal understanding of what the code actually says. That's a good thing. Um, in the States, with, with, with all of these different building control, con control systems, um, you are constantly what, trying to work out what each municipality is actually doing. They use model codes, but they're out of, half of them are out of date, or they add stuff in. One thing you can't do with a centralized system is allow local influence to be able to be a factor. There's a number of cases um, where in some, some uh, rural, some areas which, say for example, have a, a plastic pipe factory, you will discover that the codes require guess what, plastic pipes, um, with a centralized system, and they won't be the cheapest, and they won't be the best, um, but they will actually help the local economy. That's not a good criteria. So, in, so basically a system will actually eradicate that kind of level of, of local influence. Standards, acceptability, yeah, you wanna be able to get new innovations, cheaper, faster, better into the system as fast as you possibly can, with the caveat that that checking has to be really good to avoid some of the problems we've seen in, in the past few years. Feedback, oh, I'm sorry, feedback faster. Um, yep, so if there are mistakes, if there are problems, if there are questions, you wanna get them solved as soon as you can. You don't wanna be hanging around waiting for decisions. Things have to keep moving and have to keep moving fast. Um, and uh, the operation, yeah, if there's a one system that people know, the actual implementation, you know, the actual building control office, the people who have to do the work can all be trained to the same standard. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll finish on that point in, in a second. So uh, on balance, as I studied these systems, um, my sense was that a centralized system actually has greater advantages to a localized one, given the massive pressures of construction that we'll face uh, at the world in the next few years. Which is not to say um, uh, that, that, that a unified singular system is actually doesn't come with serious problems, and it does. Um, it's just probably the lesser of two evils. I would uh, therefore suggest um, some optimum attributes of a centralized system, which are both drawn from localized systems, but they're also drawn from some very effective systems around the world uh, that might um, ameliorate some of the issues that we've talked about here. Um, the first point is that the code should be written in the technical language and not a legal language. These are for, codes are for helping people to understand how you build things that are healthy, that are safe, that provide quality of life. They're not about maintaining a legal uh, premise for discussion within a parliamentary building. So it has to be as technical as it possibly can. Um, the, uh, the Svensk Biganorm in uh, Sweden is probably one of the better written codes uh, in, in the world today. Secondly, what they say should be, less, should be less specific about what you build, but should be phrased in the, in, in the, in the uh, conclusions you're trying to reach. 
performance standards. So instead of saying a wall's got to be 30 centimeters thick, what you instead you do is you, you argue that you need to meet a minimum uh, heat loss U value of 1.3, whatever, whatever it is. So you try and provide uh, standards that can be set rather than specific requirements. Uh, now, that, of course, requires some degree of technical understanding and, and knowledge, which I understand. But, uh, the, 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 there is, so there is a caveat to that, because in some buildings under the definition, some buildings are so simple and so minimal that they don't need to be written in complicated terms. They just need to be specified to make things go better. But for the bigger, you know, the, 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 the multi-unit um, accommodation, that we, we're obviously going to be thinking about more and more, um, these kind of things should be written in performance standards and not in specific regulations. All of the codes should not just be statements of, of law. They should actually be backed up with technical data, information of how you actually can achieve this. Scottish code is very good. It actually has a whole section in the back. English code actually isn't too bad. Uh, building regulations um, that actually provides um, information in a typographically distinct text, kind of lay, lays it out. Building inspectorate, the people who actually do the work, they should be highly trained. Um, they're not always. Um, it's, it's a job, I think, that's undervalued. What Their role is a critically important one. So consequently, they deserve higher pay. They deserve training. Uh, when I served as uh, city architect for the city of Milwaukee, um, I insisted that all building inspectors had a minimum degree in architecture. Uh, and that's because architects, we're not designers, we're problem solvers. We solve problems. And these young men and women could actually go into situations and suggest alternative solutions to doing things, particularly in the inner city, so their role was not to be guardians of the code, but actually implementers and interpreters of the code and getting things done. Uh, the German building police are excellent, the London building surveyors are, are, are pretty good. Um, but the high level of quality in, in, in the United States, I'm afraid, and a lot of inspectors are uh, retired tradespeople. Uh, it's a job people retire into. That's not the best way of implementing and interpreting a code. That's an important part. The appeals uh, mechanism should be within the system, not within the courts, because it needs to be fast and quick to move things along. Uh, there are a whole range of, uh, of ways in which a code can actually be um, softened to allow for people to move through fast stage approvals, approve them a bit at a time, conditional appro approvals. You can do this if you do this. Um, type approvals. Yep, this is a building type that we know. And if you use these particular codes here, you're going to be fine. So these are all elements that exist in many code systems around the world. They can be brought together. I'm not suggesting a world code, by the, by the way, but I'm suggesting kind of model information that can be shared which can develop uh, countrywide, regionwide, statewide uh, co codes that can incorporate these systems in, in such a way. So to summarize, uh, basically, health is a right. Yes, I think the Italian model is a, is a great one. Health is a, is a basic human right. Um, and that the risk is going to be inevitable in the future, uh, specifically within regard to the physical environment, simply because of population environment, regardless of all of the other challenges that we face. Law, I think, is a, is a, is a, a powerful moderator um, to physical construction. They can do poor things, but can do good things as well. Um, the centralized system with, um, with additional attributes can be uh, an effective way of not solving the problem, but addressing an inevitably growing problem to a great extent, to maintaining and increasing the ability to provide uh, physical environments that are healthy and safe, and ultimately enable us to think about the broader issues of providing, raising the, co the concept of a quality of life for everybody on the planet. Merci pour votre, for, pour votre attention. Merci, bonjour à tous. Thank you. Good morning. I'm an architect, a practitioner. I teach at the Architectural School of Nantes and uh, have a PhD in contemporary architecture as well. And I don't know if there's a link between my presentation and what we said this morning because the scope is so wide and perhaps a link as well with what we said yesterday, perhaps. And to start with, since we're talking about the language of architecture that links up people, there's two things I'd like to say. First, we have eight people in our agency. And what I'm going to say now, what I'm going to show you is the result of a group approach. It's nothing personal. It's 
work produced by a group. We all share the same passions for architecture. And the second thing is that more or less all of us are teachers as well. And yesterday, uh, a student asked a question. I think I got it right. The question was, well, given all the risks we're talking about, that we've been talking about since yesterday, how can we act? And you know what I say when I'm with my students, and these students are 20, and they've lived two years of COVID, I say, it's very complex, but we have the desire to do things. And also, I wouldn't say that they feel despair, but they want to know how they can act in a tangible manner. And I hope I'll manage uh, to answer that question, if we have some students in the assembly today, that there are many struggles, but we want these struggles to be happy struggles. This is what we try and do at our agency as well. Alors, euh, je, je vais commencer par euh, une citation, en fait. Euh, alors, on est euh, dans le Haut Atlas marocain, euh, dans les Aït Bougemez. This is Aït Bougemez in Morocco. As you can see, this is a land architecture and earth. The uh, buildings have the same color as the mountains. And Augustin Berg, to start with, who lived in this region. Jacques Berg is, was his father, and he was uh, specialized, of course, in all of that. And this is the quote. Uh, the problem with modernity is that we lose sense of the deep meaning of landscape in uh, the human societies before anything uh, happens that looks like uh, modernity uh, ordinary practice leads to nice landscapes but in modern uh, societies it's the contrary that happens ordinary practices lead to something that's ugly and therefore, what's important is to protect the landscape with special measures. In modern societies, people usually think what is ugly is where they live daily. But when they can, they're looking elsewhere, uh, time-wise, or for, to settle down different landscapes that are nicer. This is why in rich countries, there's a massive phenomena such as uh, tourism. And therefore, uh, we have to be paying attention to the landscape as, as such. A, a landscape which is embodied by photography, the cinema, and TV, without talking about specialized uh, studies. The problem is the divergence between this ability to appraise and comprehend the landscape on one hand, and on the other hand, the ordinary uh, behaviors that destroy the landscape. This difference didn't exist in the past, but then could be turned into a landscape uh, thinking process. End of quote. So there are two worlds, the Western world that um, we uh, work on and another uh, landscape which is a vernacular landscape. Next image is the landscape we're faced with. This is what we call in French ZAC, Concerted Town Planning Zones, as we say. Sorry for this literal translation. And this is... Uh, this is a comparison of, of photos close to the town of Nantes because this is where we work. This is where the agency is. So it's it's back and front, if you will. And this is reality. There's no caricature here. That is, there are some uh, places that are quite natural, as you can see, with the vernacular uh, built construction. This is a farm uh, in wetlands. And on the other hand, what we produce and uh, what we build, what, what I mean by we is something general. This, this is what we're trying to fight against this. We fight against this, and, uh, as a, and that means we don't want to have artificial soils and, of course, architecture is something political because we can't uh, artificialize soils. What does that mean, uh, to have a, a soil that's not at all artificialized? Oh, I've got to slow down for the interpreters. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Good. Thank you, Chris. This is a nice reminder. So this is reality today. This is what we see as architects and practitioners on a daily basis. What else can we do? What's the path that we can tread so that we can live in our environment in a sustainable and harmonious way? Not just to look at the past, nor does it mean to urbanize our territories in a technical way that we've been doing for 40 or 50 years uh, without really thinking about these places as places where we live. Uh, we posit that, uh, and that's our assumption, is uh, an architecture of linkages or architecture as a garden. It is not about injecting more nature in uh, ar architecture, but it's a metaphor to be opened up on third landscapes that Gilles Clément uh, uh, described in a manifesto, which considered that 
these third landscapes are fragments in the planetary gardens, that is, all the places where people don't live as refugees, refuges or places for biodiversity. Conversely, all the interesting places where human beings are lead to uh, a poorer type of nature. So let's think about the future architecture, which is anthropized by definition, and these third landscapes where we have living beings, and that's how we can think about uh, living in the world on the basis of accepting uh, diversity. And this is what we try and remember for all of our projects, large scale or small scale. We focus very much on where we live. It can be homes, it can be for living units. Architecture can be seen as a relation, a link. This very much echoes what we said yesterday in the afternoon. That is a mode that's topological rather than typological. And this reflects a garden that is to accept what spontaneously springs and the plurality of things thanks to which we can ensure biodiversity in the places where we live. A garden is a place where we take care of things around us and it changes by replacement, movement, and it's ever changing. Thinking architecture as a garden is to think that architecture could be evolving, uh, we could buy into it, we could own it, not as a finished product, but as something that's uh, you know, always changing, something that's based on time and that establishes links. The conceptual process that we're going to show today is more or less the guts of what we do, and uh, we'll show you some of our achievements where architecture is seen as a garden. And we've used several themes and variations that we could call poetic. First, spaces and places, mov moments and movements, and uh, soils and thresholds. These are plays uh, on words in French. Anyway, these are sort of three themes, and then Catherine and Raphael Larrère, I'll, I'll mention them, in a book called Penser et agir avec la nature. Uh, what we're looking at is not to uh, forget the difference between nature and culture, but to change their, how they relate to each other, as uh, looking at those as participation links and not links that exclude others. So the linkages between nature and culture is something we discussed yesterday, and that is linkages between human beings, not just plants and other forms of living beings, beings and um, uh, how we relate to other human uh, beings, but uh, uh, also what we're interested in is uh, the vulnerabilities that uh, we've mentioned before that some of us uh, suffer from, uh, perhaps a majority of people. So these are the three parts. We thought that um, they're interesting ideas. I know I haven't got much time. I'm not going to give you all the details, but the whole idea is to uh, try and uh, come up with theories. It's uh, and uh, philosophical concepts connected to uh, ecology and phenomenology and the two I think are very strongly linked so spaces and places I'm not going to describe all the photos nor the images but I'm going to show you other drawings as well and projects that have mushroomed I'd like to show you some uh, work in progress uh, the chantiers we say that's very important yeah, how we produce and build things but here this morning you know we talked about PPRN that is the provision plans this is a project in Donge a place where there's a PPRI that's another acronym this is close to a refinery on the Loire estuary in places that are tough for human beings. So the question is, how can we produce something in these places? Produce a, a poetry, uh, and this is what we do. We produce something with risks, but also we produce places where people live that are woven and intertwined. And this is why we call those spaces and places, because architecture weaves something from human fabric. I have lots of quotes. I'm sorry, here's another one here that you've had time to read, I suppose. Uh, that's uh, from a uh, call which is as interesting as the drawing. And um, as you can see, we have uh, sketches and drawings. We sketch lots of things. Sometimes also we have 3D images. So that's how we produce. But when we discuss with the local elected representatives, we've realized that drawings are very important. It's essential for elected representatives. It's essential because a drawing is not something that sets things in stone, not too quickly in any case. Well, maybe you can't see this on the drawing here, so I'll skip this. But anyway, the notion is that of spaces and places. So we look at the context. Look at the context to start with. Sometimes the context is 
in the middle of a small village? What about the built structure? How can you build on top of what already exists? The students talk all about this, what is already here. It's a paradigm shift. In the past 10 years, we've seen this. We pay attention to what happens around us. Sometimes the context is a building, old, ugly, uh, 1980s building, but it's here in the built structure. So what can we do? And you know, the best thing in terms of ecology is not to destroy everything and to do with what we have already. What we have, that is, with poetry as well and the technical knowledge that we have. And also what makes sense in the way we work is what we experience. And what we experience is uh, where we come from. Here's a bit of Brittany in Pama, the southern part of the western part of Brittany. But also when you travel in a group or individually, uh, this is what we do. This is how we can look at things differently and pay attention to things differently. And uh, the void between the built structures is something very important. It's essential. Archi Architecture and architectural projects don't just stop with the facade. We have to look at the context, the environment, and what's surrounding these built structures. And this is going to guide us when we work on projects. And um, I'm not going to describe everything, but each time, as you can see, we try and show you projects. It's living uh, units here, uh, housing units, but not just that. And uh, there are amenities as well. And an architecture that focuses on the gaps as well, uh, so that we uh, are more resilient in very tough uh, territories. Here's another project. And this is a new project, 50 housing units in a former barracks in Nantes. And the objective is that the first housing unit, well, uh, nobody was using the barracks, and there were big walls around it in an urban fabric. As you can see, there are houses in the background. The objective for us is, it was to have a street with uh, collective housing units and homes on the other side. Whether it's individual homes or collective housing units, it's always interesting to have the same design approach. That is, from the ground to the roof, uh, from what's external to what's really internal, more intimate. And I think it makes even more sense today, given what we've seen and experienced with COVID. That is, uh, it was relayed by the media, and there was this debate about the fact that we can't build in the same old way for people to live in. Here's another project which is more known, if you will, and the name was known thanks to this. This is in mauve sur loire a small uh, town close to uh, Nantes. This is six housing units, uh, 520 square meters. It's partly uh, renovated. Uh, the owners wanted to destroy everything. 500 square meters, you can't do anything. And the build structure was a bit old. And, you know, we all have our homes on a, a plot of land of 1,000 uh, square meters. So how could you have six housing units? Well, it's possible. But what do people accept? what type of external space, etc. We need space for everybody, but maybe it varies according to people. We can change the size of external places uh, surrounding our homes. And here's another quote, uh, Zumto. Oh, that's very interesting. Another quote. This quote is splendid. There's a lot of enthusiasm in this quote, and this is what we need. And the quote is read again. To be inside, outside, that's incredible. Therefore, uh, small openings are essential, and the imperceptible transitions between the inside and the outside, a feeling of the place, of concentration, well, all of a sudden, you feel wrapped and connected to people or as a group. This is when what's important is individuals and the group, what's private and what's public. The interpreters are sorry for this awful translation of a splendid quote. And now, moments and movements. We think that architecture is about that, moments and movements. It's um, a baseline, if you will. We are architects, and this is what we do. We change paradigms as well, perhaps. Maybe the architects of the ordinary is something noble for us. Uh, regardless of the scale and moments and movements. We think it's quite nice uh, to talk about this uh, because our architecture uh, can rarely boil down to just one single image. I see the limits of things. A photo is not enough. Uh, 
because design uh, looked at movements and how people move into the build building. And it's, you can't just use an image. An architect is a person who's in between. That's why we like the image of a gardener. A gardener is going to produce a garden, and the garden will have uh, to be uh, cared for. You'll spend time in your garden. And for us, it's those who live here who will be caring for the building. We take time for design, that's very important, but then we hand the project over to those who are going to live there, and it's a living thing. So our projects are quite sober, I think. They're sober because we want people to uh, change it into something that's very messy, but it's not a taboo. And the, uh, the inhabitants wonder about this. They say, can we leave our mess there? And we say, yes, of course, on, on the contrary, you can do what you want. Here's another sketch. That's an ongoing project. And uh, it is a project, I'm sorry about this, I hope you can see this, but this is more or less like a survey of a garden. Of a garden. Augustin Bert called that Engawa, that is a link between the interior and the exterior. And here you have the drawn objects. I'll go back to this at the end. And to talk about the moments and movements, I will quote Jean-Christophe Bailly, who's a thinker, a writer, uh, he's very much aware of our landscapes, but not only, and also with what is habitated. Habitat is not only being at home within a few walls. You have to project yourself outside of the walls, between them, between the labyrinths. There's a question of identification and sharing. The house is not a place where you hide in. It is a place where you can open up and man can fold in and open up. And he's not the political animal of Aristotle's, nor a person living poetically um, like Hölderlin, but um, he's a citizen and he has uh, the possibility of the germ that he has in front of him and a whole field opens up. So that's also another idea of what we can design. So he, these are the drawings we're working on because every day we work with a large spectrum with either people who agree with us or not with the land developers, people who urbanize cities. And so sometimes you have to tell them stories and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But whatever, Chris was talking about the importance of the narrative and the narrative is decisive also. The possibility of allowing a project owner to agree with your work, it's important. So all this is very moving. And when, I mean, I'm not exposing the perfect world to you. Every day at the agency, we keep fighting. We can't build with the costs we have. Sometimes some homes are not made. And we fight, we fight with politicians, with private owners, but so long as there is discussion, there is hope. And each time we design, we have to bring in what has meaning for us. So here are a few moments that we've shared in the agency. There are different, of course, there's the architectural school where we teach, where we all work. And that place is absolutely exceptional, exceptional because it's uh, a support for us, for for the students, for the whole vitality for the students and, and the place. And yesterday we saw it with Susan Stature. This is Uncle Tom's city in Berlin. And that is one of the trips we had at the agency. The architecture is very sober, very simple. But the life there, thanks to the gardens, and the way in which we set in everything, the buildings in this garden, it was absolutely beautiful. And Lisbon, too, you can see uh, at the right-hand side of the screen. So these moments and movements, that's the whole purpose. That's why we're here. How we use the place, not at all how we had imagined things at the beginning. Uh, well, I'm told that I have to conclude, but just to end, this is um, a project of 100 homes in the city of Nantes. 
So I had a lot to say, but what I'd like to say is that you can live on the ground floor in cities. And to live on the ground floor in the cities, you have three meters fifty up to the ceiling. And you have uh, spaces which are very lively. We love these pictures, and that's the reason why we're here. And this is a house, a house, hundred homes are a house. You can have the same attention to what to build. And now very quickly, the architectural void contains um, a lot of biology where you have movement and that is the reality of the garden and that's the reality of um, the daily lives of this void. And souls and landings, well, we have to pay attention to the details, to the rooting of a building in the soil. It is even more important, you know, to decide on which soil you build today. Natural soil. I think we shouldn't do that anymore, actually. And here you can't really see, but here it is uh, a room. This is the, all, all the objects are drawn here, the furniture and the gardens also. Sorry, sorry, but just to conclude, I took longer than the others. It's terrible to stop you. We started half an hour late, and so you have to finish. So I'll end with a quick conclusion on our projects. And I would like to talk about how can we face risks. And here is Jean-Christophe Bailly, and I'll end with this. The technician contemporary civilization in which we are, where we have our own limitations, is accelerated model of development, a determinist area, denying diversity is not bearable anymore. Our contribution to face such global issues like uh, climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, the increase in inequality, we have to interpret that in our daily work. She's reading at top speed. So you have architecture, you have gardens, there are complexities, there is a multiplicity, and that is the condition to urban diversity. That's how we imagine architecture, as a garden that can be transformed. It's not a finished product, but it's the slow progress, a process in time, which links up people. Thank you.